Welcome to part two of how to enjoy playing killer. I still do not enjoy killer, you say. Well, no worries, because I'm going to have actual tips and not just complaining in this video. In part one, we went over the unchangeables that make killer unfun. Things that, no matter how annoying they can be, they're always going to be there and you're just going to have to deal with them. In this part, we're going to talk about the semi-changeables. Things that you don't directly control, but you can play around in a more healthy way than what you've been doing. And with it, we're going to create some slightly more long-term goals. Things that you'll have to work at a bit, but once you get them, Killer will be a much better experience, I promise. Okay, so first let's look at one of the biggest offenders to Killers in DVD. The Gens. These Gens today, man, they're getting finished faster than my dog every time I wash the pillowcases. Seriously, these things are just non-stop popping off. You're thinking about Gens while you're getting looped, you're thinking about Gens while you're hooking, while you're starting the game, while you're sleeping. These stupid things are the cause of so much stress and frustration and annoyance. I constantly have killers DC in solo queue because the Gens are going too quick. There's a reason why killer meta is only Gen regression perks. So what's the long term goal? It's simple. F*** the Gens. Not like that. I mean ignore them. This is counter to what every killer main will tell you, but newsflash, they're the same people who are constantly whining about how unfun everything is. So seriously, repeat after me, f*** the gens at every moment of the game. When you pick your perks, f*** the gens. These perks are all really strong, but they're boring as hell, they're all passive. It's the same gameplay experience as playing with no perks, but the torture just lasts a little longer. When you load in, f*** the gens. Use them to find people, but after that, just worry about chases. When you feel like you're taking too long to down a survivor, hey, f*** the gens. They're the only reason you feel that way. Chase that little sh** because they're probably good and you can learn a lot from them. In case you don't get it yet, f*** the gens. Do not think about the generators. Playing for generators will only make the game stressful. Now here you might be saying, I thought you said I could enjoy killer and still try to win. And f***ing gens doesn't sound like I'm trying to win. You can still try to win without giving yourself every advantage. Hey man, it's smoky so his toe slipped over a little, you know, it's just a game man. This is a league game. The goal here is having fun first, not playing optimally. There's no championship, you don't need Mamba mentality to play DBD. Okay, so you say, I play a few games and I've learned to ignore gens. I don't care about them. I barely even hear the noise anymore. But I am still not enjoying the game because chasing sucks and I had 20 pallets dropped on my head. My killer's looking like sloth from the goonies here. Okay, we got two goals for this problem and both involve learning to love the chase. I mean, the chase is dead by daylight, unless you really just like kicking gens or walking the hooks. If you don't like chasing and downing survivors, I don't know why you're playing this game. The first half of loving the chase is that you need to learn your M1 killer mind games. M1, or mouse 1, means only using your basic attack, no powers. This means catching survivors with good old fashioned trickery, tomfoolery, and quite possibly even skullduggery. Hide that red light, hesitate at corners, take advantage of line of sight, guess where you think they'll be. With how many different tiles, loops, and survivor playstyles there are in this game, you can always learn a new mind game or strategy, no matter how much you play. For this goal, I played a lot of Ghostface, but Pig, Legion, Trapper, any primarily M1 killer will help you improve a lot quicker than, say, Huntress or Nemesis, killers with anti-loot powers. Yes, there are ridiculous setups that can spawn for Survivor, like even Ots couldn't catch this guy who got two TNL walls next to each other. But for the most part, admit that your M1 game probably isn't as good as it could be. Luckily, since you ignore gens now, you can afford to chase that good Survivor stress-free and analyze where they wait, how they move, and how they adapt. The second part of learning to love chases is to learn your killer power. Getting good at M1s first will make you better at every killer, but if you have two to three mains, then learn them. To learn a killer, you really have to fail with their power quite a bit to see what you can and can't get away with. With so many different loops, hitboxes, maps, and perks, it's really impossible to completely master a killer on every map. This dude has like 7k hours on Huntress and is still finding new spots to throw hatchets through. So please, take the time to fail as killer, cause you won't learn otherwise. Let's take a look at my stupid past self trying to learn Blight for the first time. First, I put on a really strong build, so I ended up winning games I probably shouldn't have, putting me against much better survivors way too early. Second, I only used my power where I thought I would get a hit, so I never improved. When learning a killer, go for no add-ons and perks that won't affect your chase, but also won't carry you to play against teams you aren't ready for yet. Use your power literally anywhere to see if it works or not. When I play Survivor, almost all of my losses come from my team or myself making stupid mistakes. Rarely do I ever play a killer who really knows their power well. And trust me, it's obvious when they do. So learning to love the chase really just means being okay with failing at first. I promise that within a short time you'll be ending chases quickly with a combo of M1 mind games and your power, and you'll start to even appreciate good survivors because they can actually still outplay you and teach you something you don't know. So now you don't care about gens, you're getting pretty good with 2-3 to three killers, and you're probably getting better at every killer because you kept working on your M1 gameplay. At this point, you'll probably start to get frustrated at the survivor meta, especially when you really outplayed them and they got bailed out by a perk or item. 
Here you can start adding back in killer add-ons, as they can give a big boost when you need it, but really it's not some miracle counter. It is frustrating when a survivor dead hards your power, especially if you have a cooldown. Or when you're having a competitive game and two or three adrenalines pop, completely destroying your momentum. You may start to get tempted to camp, tunnel, and break out the gen slowdown perks again. So the third goal is to learn to stay calm. This will let you do a few things. Number one is remember who has what. Knowing which characters have dead hard, have used their unbreakable, are trying to force decisive strike. This will all be much easier if you have a cool head. Number two, it lets you see the massive confidence that these perks give survivors. Meta doesn't make them good, but it definitely makes them think they are, just like me when I was learning Blight. So when you see a player that has no fear, like this guy who definitely should have dropped that pallet, they're probably loaded out with meta and you can treat them that way. Which way is that? Number three, have no mercy. Now I'm a big sucker for letting survivors go when there's a DC or being worried about camping and tunneling since I know how it feels to be on the other side. But with no gen regression against decent survivors, I mean, fuck them. I don't mean face camping and intentional tunneling, but I do mean snowballing with no mercy, pressuring the save if they leave him on the hook too long, and kill him if you run into him, regardless of who got off the hook win. The loaded out swifts and clicky squads are usually the easiest to tear apart, because they're too altruistic, or they think you'll play just as dumb as the last killer they destroyed. Staying calm will let you do the little things right, the things that they aren't used to being punished for. If they call you a tryhard after the game, that pretty much just means that you did to them what they thought they were going to do to you. To them, it's never their fault they lost, so don't waste any of your time arguing with them. Can't be worried about that shit. Life goes on, man. If they can't do five gens with you having no slowdown perks, that's their problem. So if you follow these steps, you'll probably lose a good amount of games for a month or two, depending on how much you play. Especially as MMR just for you having no gen regression. But I promise it will click, and you will start winning a lot. Yes, even with no gen regression. I promise, slowdown perks have nothing on being actually good at killer gameplay. You'll also be in a lot better MMR for your skill, not for your perks skill. But there will come games where you get beaten so badly that you feel like you haven't learned shit. So I want to cover an important fact, that each game of DBD is heavily, HEAVILY affected by RNG. For those of you that don't know what RNG is, it's the fun idea that while speedrunning a game, you can randomly get hit by an airplane. But actually, it's just a way of creating new and different experiences through random variables in the game. Left 4 Dead was amazing at this. You could play the same campaign 50 times and new item, weapon, and special infected spawns would drastically change the way you played. Even a few maps had paths that were randomly generated, making a new challenge each time. Dead by Daylight's RNG takes place mostly in their maps. Now first, let's realize that even loading into a good or bad map is essentially RNG. The fact that you can play on Dead Dog Saloon or Fractured Cow Shed should be a massive indicator that this shit ain't gonna be fair every time. Add in the fact that survivors can send you to a map that favors them massively. But you can't do this to me. And you should already be starting to think, okay, maybe winning every match with skill alone is totally impossible. Now even if you get a good or average map, the RNG of gen spawns, loop tiles, totems, and exit gates can change your game entirely. The killer shack on the Asylum and Chapel maps is a great example. If this window faces the wall, it's not so bad to catch survivors. But if it's on the other side, a single survivor can literally loop you for 10 minutes, since it leads straight into more strong tiles. So when you combine a bunch of small RNG things like this in a game where seconds are crucial, they can really start to stack up for or against you. And yeah, it does go both ways. It's easy to think you won with your skill when you get Midwitch as a starstruck infectious fright nurse, but come on, you had a ton of help. Seeing the negatives when things don't go your way is human nature, but did you appreciate getting Rotten Fields as Hillbilly last game, or just chalk up your win to your own skill? Did you appreciate when this window was blocked on Haddonfield, or even that none of your survivors brought a strong medkit or a brand new part? I know that's not technically RNG, but it might as well be because you have no control over it. The long term goal here is to recognize that RNG, from map choice to loop spawns to survivor items and perks, can absolutely make or break a win. After a loss, take a second to think about what you had no control over and maybe realize it's not all on you. Imagine you're LeBron James showing up to a basketball game and the refs are like, well for this one, we rolled the dice and your rim is at 15 feet, your opponents can call their own fouls, and Russell Westbrook is on your team. So that's it. Four long term goals that you can work on to rebuild your killer gameplay from the ground up. I promise it's fun. It actually makes you feel like you just got the game for the first time. A point that I didn't touch on, because it will happen naturally, is that the lack of expectations that comes with doing all this will immediately increase the enjoyability of the game. True Talent recently played all the killers with no perks, and while I haven't finished watching it yet, this comment really sums it up. Tujdudubus97 writes, What I felt from this is, for some weird reason, going in empty kind of emptied our mind of being competitive and being emotional at the game. I've watched True for a long time, and recently, I felt he wasn't having fun while playing the game. Yeah, sure, if he does a crazy outplay, he laughs sometimes, but some of his laughs in this video seem very genuine. 
If true talent can benefit from this strategy, then you can too. I hope you found part two of this video series useful and I encourage you to go implement some of the strategies. In the final part of this series, I'll have a bunch of quick tips that can be used in any match to keep killer fun. Mainly ways to apply pressure, combat toxicity, and learn when to take it easy. Until then, get out there and start losing. But learning at the same time. But there will be a lot of losing, I just want to be clear on that.